All right. I think we are on time, so we shouldn't, shouldn't be waiting anymore. Uh, so this is the present and future of Drupal initiatives, which also will be a little bit about the past of Drupal initiatives, um, because that's interesting. And I'm Gabor Hoichi. I work as a full stack community organizer at Acquia, which is a title I made up for myself. Um, because I kind of work in developer tools, I work on initiative organization, I work on events, I work on social media, I work in marketing, so I work in a lot of different areas, whatever helps the Drupal community move forward. And I have almost 20 years of um, experience and involvement in the Drupal core community, it will be 20 years in September. Uh, so it's this year. And to start off, I have three random things, three random things from my full stack that I have requests for you. So the first thing, because we are the developer conference, is that I'm looking for developers to help me or us, the community, with updating Farberist for PHP 8.1. Farberist is a library that we use in the Drupal module upgrader to update Drupal 7 code bases to Drupal 9 and 10. And it has some issues with PHP 8.1. I can explain you the details. So look for me under, after the session if you're interested. Another random stuff from the full stack is that I am the bearer of the torch for Drupal Dev Days. So I lead the selection process for next year. We are still looking for teams to volunteer to run this event for next year. So if you're interested, the submission deadline is September 1st. Uh, come look for me again, and I can send you the link. It's a very elaborate spreadsheet that we use to uh, propose organizer teams and then pick the right one. And then finally, I'm also involved with uh, DrupalCon Europe, uh, Lil. Uh, so here's my little friend, Lil Rooster, as the mascot for DrupalCon Lil. Um, so if you want to win a free ticket to DrupalCon Lil, make a selfie with this um, mascot and then post it on social media with the right hashtags you have a chance to win a ticket. So those are random things from my stack. Find me about the first two, and the last one you can do yourself. Disclaimer for all this talk, unless otherwise noted, the things that I'm going to explain are opinions and not statements of fact uh, for the future. So there's some things where I inform you about uh, facts. So there is a bunch of things where it's my thinking and also thinking of other people in the core committer team. Some of this session was heavily influenced by Larry Escola and the core committer on site as well that we had a couple months ago in Kingston, uh, where we were thinking a lot about how we can move forward better and what the future holds for Drupal initiatives. And it's also influenced by my discussions with developers everywhere um, to help them understand better the value of things that we are working on. So to begin with, uh, who started with Drupal before Drupal 8 of the audience? Okay, so about half of the audience before Drupal 8, okay. How many of you started after Drupal 9 was released? Okay, we have a few of you. Okay, that's nice. Uh, who contributed to an initiative before? Also the half of the room, which is roughly the same people as before Drupal 8. So the, thing we'll t the things we'll talk about today, what are the initiatives, uh, how are initiatives organized? Uh, we'll talk a little bit about funding. I don't have a magic bullet solution, but we'll talk about how some things are funded. We'll talk about how initiatives got things uh, done, landing stuff, uh, what the status of some of the key initiatives are, uh, and we'll talk about zooming in and out of initiatives, what's above them, below them, and how those things work. So let's start with what's an initiative. So Dries had this Drupal 7 retrospective in 2011, and I did a lot of Dries note reviews. I went back all the way to 2011 and reviewed all of the Dries notes, uh, 12 years of Dries notes for messaging around initiatives because Dries notes are the main way that we communicate uh, about initiatives and the status of things and how we change processes and structures. So this is where he had the Drupal 7 retrospective in 2011. And the things that he mentioned that were problems is that people were not empowered. Um, the release cycle was not very predictable for Drupal 7. Uh, there was a lack of high bandwidth communication. 
in the Drupal 7 release uh, creation process. We didn't have good priorities uh, for the Drupal 7 release. We didn't have a way to communicate our priorities is what that means. Not that we had bad priorities, but we didn't have a way to communicate them. There were too many critical bugs, and we were regressing on performance here and there and didn't really care about that too much. Uh, and he wanted to set up initiatives to solve uh, other than the last two uh, pies. So he wanted to solve empowerment, the release cycle predictability, high bandwidth communication, and better priorities. Uh, because the initiatives would themselves be empowered to work towards their goals. Um, the high bandwidth communication could be had between the initiative leads and they could uh, relay communication towards the initiative. And the initiatives themselves would communicate the priorities better. And so he would pick strategic initiatives for the release and that would help the community work towards one goal and it would help us communicate the goals of Drupal Core as well. I think there's also a bunch of benefits for the community, which I'm not sure that we realized at the time, but we realized through the years. So first, it shrinks down Drupal because Drupal is now this huge thing and it's very hard to get involved. But if you want to get involved, an initiative is great because an initiative has much tighter goals. Uh, they have a space that's much smaller than the Drupal community. They have meetings that you can know the people there in the initiative and kind of grow your uh, karma and your community contributions within the initiative. So it shrinks Drupal down for uh, new contributors as well as existing contributors. It gives fine points of contact for talking to people about whether it's project browser, automatic updates, et cetera, so we know who to talk to. And it's less of a hidden knowledge with the core contributors. Uh, and it could also make contributors more successful. I, I don't know how many of you tried to submit a random bug report with a patch on the Drupal OQ you have a very low likeliness of it getting attention. But if you work with an initiative, you have a shared set of goals and you lift each other up and you work together for the same goal. So that kind of helps um, with the whole community as well, I think. And then later on, Dries outlined this criteria for setting, the setting up the initiatives. So he wanted initiatives to have breakthrough outcomes for Drupal. He wanted them to be clearly linked to the product vision and survey results that he has regularly. So basically feedback from users and, um, and uh, to the vision that's set out for uh, the Drupal project. Um, he wants them to be focused, that require focused resources so that we can work together on one thing instead of various different things and to improve and involve collaboration among different stakeholders. So one thing that he didn't really define and I think has been a problem for many initiatives that I would add as a plus one is that initiatives should have a clear exit criteria and we kind of figured this out through the years that we need to have a way to finish an initiative and move on. And we set up some initiatives that are like this never ending initiatives that are very, that are impossible to get out of because they are just things that we always need to improve. So that's an area where we are trying to improve. For example, we used to have the API first initiative, which could be forever running, like Drupal could be always better for API first solutions. And then we realized that it's much better to focus resources on specific things. So we started running the decoupled menus initiative, which was a focused goal within API first that we mostly achieved and we delivered with uh, Drupal 10.1. So we can have more of these focused things that are easier to achieve and we have, can have closure and success and celebrate, I think is important. And there's a lot to improve on this area for existing initiatives. And so these are the initiatives that Dries uh, always returns to and that has this criteria, they are called the strategic initiatives. These are the ones that Dries reports on, uh, such as automatic updates, project browser, et cetera. There used to be multilingual, promote Drupal. There's a very long list of past initiatives. So these are strategic initiatives, which means that it's basically the role of the project lead to pick out these initiatives. But at the same time, the community is working on a lot of things and they are very successful with a lot of things. So there's also a side on the community initiatives, which is the other category of initiatives. For example, the box mesh initiative was set up to reduce the average time and in the queue for bugs and also to risk to improve response time for bugs in the queue and they are very successful. 
the contribution events initiative was set up to run contribution events and help mentor new people to run contribution events. The Drupal 7 soft lending initiative is, pr is pretty recent, helps with Drupal 7, um, people getting out of Drupal 7 and have a soft lending. And Promote Drupal became a community initiative after it was a strategic initiative, so there's also a transition path that's possible. So theoretically, anyone can set up a new community initiative. Uh, I would um, welcome you to think about what you want to do and if you have the resources and time to run it because it's, uh, it's a whole endeavor, but it's also a lot of fun. So for example, to look at this, the Bug Smash initiative started uh, in 2020, 2020, and this was the open bugs um, count by years open. So these were the fresh bugs, and those were the bugs that have been open for five years, six years, seven years. It's going down. And this is how successful they were uh, reducing that count throughout the years. It started a bit slow, and then started to pick up as the initiative became more and more successful, and they started to build their tooling out. And then it really picked up in 2022. So we are much more successful with responding to bugs as they come in, but we are also successful with not letting our bugs age because we are uh, resolving them be before, they, before they age out. So this is a community, yes. So, so this is a community initiative that I don't think uh, Dries returns to report about. But I think it's very important for the Drupal community to have timely feedback in the issue queues and to resolve these bugs and to get attention even for a five-year-old bug. And this is an initiative that we have a representative of. So Len, if you want to stand up, Len will be here for the rest of the conference as well. He was here before the, um, today as well, but he will be here for the rest of the conference too. And you can look for Len and uh, join the initiative or go to the Bucksmash channel on Slack and join there. So this is very important, but it's not a, it's not a strategic initiative in terms of Dries' definition. So we have a lot of these important things that we are doing that are also initiatives. So how are they organized? So I just said to look for the Slack channel for Bucksmash is like the go-to answer for if you are not at the conference, you should go to the Slack channel of the initiative. Uh, there's the drupal.org slash about slash core page lists the strategic initiatives and it has a sidebar link to community initiatives. So you can find the summary of initiatives there. So that was the primary thing where you join if you're not at an event. Uh, but then um, events like this are the best, I think, to join. So here we have at least the Bucksmash initiative. We have Project Browser initiative, which will host a buff right after my session. So if you want to get involved with the Project Browser Initiative, there's a buff right after this session that we can talk about that. Um, and we also have uh, the admin UI uh, folks here, uh, mostly in the contribution room, but there's going to be a session uh, later tomorrow as well about that too. So I think the best to get involved is at events. If you can't make it to an event, then the second best thing is probably on Slack because you can see the dynamics of the team. You can see what they're working on. There's meetings on Slack. If there are video meetings, they are also plugged into Slack. So uh, that's an easy way to engage. But there's a lot of different initiatives. So here, for example, 2018, Dries had this slide about the initiatives at the time. And there was an initiative involving the security team. There was an initiative involving the DA for better technical evaluation on Drupal.org. There was an initiative that was primarily worked on by the documentation working group. So there's a lot of different areas of Drupal where initiatives uh, intersect and um, are involved with. So uh, wh wherever you end up, there's probably something useful that you can contribute to. And Dries wanted to set out these initiatives to have higher bandwidth communication and empowerment. So he lined up originally in 2011 these values for an initiative lead. So the initiative lead only needs to be a good organizer, a good communicator, a team builder, and a good architect. That's the only requirement for an initiative lead. There's no other requirements. Only to be a good people person and a good technical person and team builder, organizer, communicator. Um, so that didn't work out, obviously. So most of the initiatives uh, don't have one person that has all of these qualities. 
And a few years later, Shannon Vitesse had this vision where an initiative would need a whole bunch of more people. So IO is initiative owner here, and then there would be um, there would be project managers, there would be teachers, there would be um, communicators, there would be funders, there would be the technical experts and the themers, designers, UX people, and then general front end leadership. So ideally, an initiative would have skill sets from all over Drupal, including funding. Um, and that would be technical experts that are not the same as initiative owners. So we've seen that initiatives where there were multiple different expertise areas covered were more successful, and initiatives where the, some, of these, some of these responsibilities were, were distributed and divided between other people were also more successful. Uh, if we have a great architect that builds out an amazing solution for something, but they don't build a team, it's very hard to get their solution accepted in Drupal core because you don't get reviewers, you don't get the enthusiasm, you don't get the blog post, the communication, the sessions, et cetera, done. It's not enough to be a good architect. So ideally, we would move towards not necessarily this model, this is from 10 years ago, but from a model where we have more of these experts and initiatives, and we need a lot of work to do to get even close uh, from this vision 10 years ago. So that is an area where we definitely need improvements. Uh, for funding, is another, yet another area where we need a lot of improvements. We don't have a general solution. So some initiatives are driven by a company that they do something and they, they fund it and they donate it to the community, sort of. So uh, for example, Workspaces was something like this that Pfizer primarily funded and then helped um, get into core. Uh, then also some employers fund people to join initiatives or lead initiatives. For example, Ula Bates currently funding Christina. Uh, for six months to work on core, but there's other employers that work on, or that fund specific people to work on initiatives or have a general fund that funds their employers. But I think what I've seen most done is the indirect funding of initiatives. So for example, companies send people to events and then the people at events sit down with uh, initiatives and contribute there. Or then you, have a you have a customer project that you're working on something and then it ends up being contributed to Drupal core, which is how single directory components originally uh, originated, for example, as was sort of an indirect funded uh, project that ended up in core. Uh, the, where we had success with direct funding was more around spe very specific goals. For example, we had uh, funding for Drupal 8 porting at, in the Drupal 8 Accelerate project back in 2015. So these companies put in a bunch of money and funded uh, uh, core contributors to port country projects from Drupal 7 to Drupal 8. So we had the Promote Drupal initiative where we had, uh, this was, let's go back. So this was three years later. We had the Promote Drupal initiative where those companies funded, a, uh, put in a bunch of money to have better exposure of Drupal strengths on Drupal.org and through press releases and through slideshows and through other means in the Promote Drupal initiative, and then a bit, little bit later, uh, the Drupal Association was looking for a staff augmentation to work on the GitLab initiative, and so that's how they had Fran and Irina and people like them to work on the GitLab initiative last year. Um, and then most recently, uh, there was the Pitchberg Fund, where Dries uh, was raising money and Dio was raising money uh, for randomly submitted things from the Drupal community that get funded um, this, this year, and they're currently working on their solutions. But these are very focused fundraisers for very specific things. They are not a general solution for funding Drupal initiatives, or it's not a pool of money that we can draw from. There's one interesting development that Dries showed in Pittsburgh 2023, which, which may sound exciting or alarming depending on what you think about it. So it says the Drupal Association is taking a more active role in driving product innovation in Drupal core. And they didn't really detail what this means, so I went back to the DA and asked them, like, what, what are these letters mean here? And so their current, current goal, as they are working on, is to try to connect people and money and excess time within their uh, com the companies that they have uh, connections with, the supporting partners, with the needs of the Drupal core initiative. So basically it's a mix and match 
system that they are looking at implementing right now, where they would direct people from companies to people in initiatives, or to uh, initiative teams, so they can help make stuff happen. So it's um, an interesting direction. It's still not actually directing or driving product innovation. It's not setting the priorities, but it's more funneling more uh, pe people that are available to help to these core initiatives. So I hope that works out, because that would be the most general funded large care solution that we've ever seen in the Drupal community to help with initiatives. So I'm looking forward to that. So next is how do initiatives get stuff done? How do they lend their things? And the original idea in 2011 from Dries, these are the original initiatives, was that we would have these gates and then the initiatives would be working in Git branches. It was 12 years ago. So the initiatives would be working in Git branches, and then they would be merged when they meet all the gates. That was the idea. So you would work in a Git branch, and then if you are good in performance, accessibility, usability, documentation, testing, and you are not introducing new critical bugs, then you are merged. And so this was 2011. That he also wanted to set up a 15 critical bug uh, uh, limit that didn't really work out. Um, so, and this was 2011, and then two years later in Portland, he said that we are almost done with Drupal 8 now, it's going to be released. Uh, it was not released for two more years. So, so two years later, he said that, okay, it was a problem, and so our solution is that we'll use Git branches, and from the Git branches, we'll merge them when they're ready. And so we don't put stuff into Drupal 8 because the way we put stuff in Drupal 8, the longest running thing was the bottleneck for everything else because if the longest running thing is not done, then none of the other things will be possible to be released. So we need to put them in Git branches and then merge things when shippable and also introduce time-based releases. So if something is still running, we don't merge them in, but we only merge the uh, things in that are done. And so all of this sounded good in, 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 um, in theory in 2011 and also sounded good in 2015. And we still didn't do it, not in 2011, not in 2015. And the reason we didn't do it is because a lot of the changes that we were doing affected a lot of things in Drupal core. And the initiatives where we tried to do this, that we went away in this black box and worked happily there and then tried to came back with this big gift of black box that now we give this to the community, were always met with a lot of reviews and feedback at the end that should have happened throughout the whole process. So we found that Drupal's, Drupal's innovation process doesn't really work well with these big, long-running, big changes that we want to do. We can't do them separately in a separate sandbox because when we come back with this big present of set of huge set of changes, then they get scrutinized and pulled apart and then nothing happens and we burn people out, which is sort of what happens. So what we do instead, even though we try to do branching twice, so instead of branches, what we've introduced is we've introduced semantic versioning, which allows us to have a major, minor, and patch, really, uh, patch number, finally first thing since a very long time. And this allows us to release new things that are backwards compatible, so we can put stuff into core and don't need to put it uh, outside of core. And then we've introduced the deprecation process for things that we want to remove something and want to add something instead, so that we can put them into these, uh, into these minor releases without them being developed separately. And then we've introduced the experimental modules so that we can put in half done things in Drupal core that are alpha beta and release them as part of Drupal core because we are getting earlier feedback from users because it's not in a separate branch. And we also get much earlier feedback from core committers and reviewers because it's not in a separate branch. Um, and we can explicitly mark them as beta or alpha so that we make it clear that it's not done yet. And then we've, as Dries predicted, we've introduced scheduled releases. So that's the only thing, I guess, that was predicted and became true, is that we introduced that so that we can release these things more often. And so we have sort of the, this infrastructure now of introducing the small things 
that are new and through the deprecation process and the big things that are new through experimental modules within the code base um, and without having them as separate branches. So, and to support that, we need to beef up the core committer team to review all of these new things. So we started adding more core committers as time went by, um, starting uh, with Drupal 8's, throughout Drupal 8's history and continuing later then. And then the only change that we did to this process in the past five years is that we are only shipping beta experimental modules in Drupal core because they can support backwards compatibility. So we still have this model of innovating within Drupal core with experimental modules and deprecations, and we are uh, shipping half done things and new things within these new minor releases. So this is how we land something in Drupal core. How you land something with a DA or Drupal.org or an, on another team is a different question. I'm not gonna get in there because we don't have that much time. So where are we, how are we working with all of these initiatives? So the initiatives that we have for Drupal 11, which are the things that we are working on in Drupal 10, our project browser, started templates which are called recipes, automatic updates, GitLab, the great module migration, and Drupal 11 readiness. How many of you are familiar with Project Browser? Okay, about half of the room. So let me show you a very brief uh, demo video of that from a Dries note. And He has a dog-grooming business and takes reservations on her website. In the past couple years, millions of new housewives started owning pets in Europe. So her business is booming. With the increase in interest in her grooming services, it became harder to keep a personal connection with her clients. Also, automated bots figured out that posting to her website blocks her from the membership. So she decided to add a bot blocking feature to her website. She hopes to engage her clients on the website more. So potentially, other improvements are needed later. So she decided to try Project Browser module, which will make it easier to find modules for her needs and add any new feature to the site later. She needs to use Composer to add Project Browser to the site. Then she can install the module on the Drupal user interface like any other module. Now, she has a new tab on the extension screen that allows her to browse further projects. Here. The recommended filters are applied by default under which only the modules that are actively maintained and are covered under the security advisory policy are shown. And these modules are sorted after their new usage. So the most popular modules they are stored. She then goes to search for bot blocking modules and finds anti-bot. Once she finds what she was looking for, she is able to get instructions on how to use Composer to add this project to her site as well. However, there is a lot more potential hidden here. If she uses the experimental version of Project Browser, she can directly install on the web UI thanks to its integration with Packet Manager. Packet Manager is a backend feature that allows to manage Composer packages on the user interface in Drupal. So when she presses the button to install the extension, it gets pulled with Composer and installed in the Drupal environment. Now all that is left is to configure it to show up on the website as intended. So yeah, so Project Browser is basically a, U, a UI that exposes Drupal projects on your website and also is a UI for Composer to install things. Um, I think it's fun. Um, so if you are more, if you're interested to get, get involved and learn more, then there's a buff right after this session uh, that to be involved with. So who of you are familiar with automatic updates? Our next question, okay, another half. So we'll have one more brief video. That's the last video that I have in, in this session, also from a Dries note, and then we'll discuss what we've seen. Hi, I'm Trisha Grano, and I am a contributor to our shared website. Johanna Ari went through a major version update this year, so she understands the importance of keeping her site up to date to prepare for GP10. But due to all the demands of her favorite dog buying, she neglected keeping her site up to date. The best of us fall into this trap, but luckily, the community has been working on a solution for this. The easiest way for Johanna to get up to date and keep secure is with the automatic updates module. Since this is another contributor module, she 
using both a project browser and install it from there. After installing the automatic updates and automatic updates extension module, Johanna realizes that her EDU cookie compliance module is also out of date. She can update it with the automatic updates extension module. When she upgraded from Drupal 8 to Drupal 9, Johanna had to manually run Composer to update a module. Now, she uses submodule and automatic updates to update the EDU cookie compliance module to be compatible with Drupal 10. Now that the module is updated, Johanna realizes that she needs a core team to review updates. She can now follow the tutorial slide and review the implementation. Since Johanna is doing this in her development environment, the code base is writable and she can apply and test the updates before deploying them to her live code. All right, so that was automatic updates. Um, it's basically a UI to keep you keep you up to date and to inform you about the needs the needs on your site to be updated, and it could run as an attended update like we've seen here. So some of it could run as unattended in the background if you want to, but as you may have seen in the video, it suggests to run it on your development environment and then push it live. It also has a developer API, so it has very rich for developers, so for example, this is an API that you can use to, to refuse to run updates if the website is at peak times. Uh, this is like a, sort of a made up example that we can look at for how to work with the automatic updates module. So this responds to the automatic updates or rather the package manager's pre-create event and pre-apply event, which is how it creates the environment where the update runs is pre-create and pre-apply is when it applies the update to the live environment. Um, so we can subscribe to that those events and say we want to add error if peak time. And in the add error if peak time, we can say if it's peak time, then we add an error. And if we add an error, then because there's an error, the event will not uh, go through and will not apply the update. And is peak time here is just a random thing. It doesn't really matter. So automatic updates has a lot of these APIs to allow you to limit to which things, well, not just automatic updates. So automatic updates and package manager work together. And package manager and automatic updates has these APIs that allow you to stop updates from happening or filter a certain list of packages that support updates, et cetera. And the final big component, I think, in these the trio of initiatives is recipes, which is a way to automate site building steps, is what I like to say. So it's basically a site building automation thing. So here, let's say this is an example recipe from Kevin Quillen. So this is a recipe tailored for best practices for kickstarting a new project. It's a sites type of recipe. It installs a bunch of modules, the YAML file, and then it imports these configurations. It imports all of the configuration from media, media library path auto, it imports some of the redirect configuration, and then it does some transformations to configuration that comes with what's called the config actions. So it changes the use admin theme setting in node settings to true so that the node submission form uses the admin theme. It makes admin only registration enabled so people can't register themselves, and it sets the system admin theme to gin. So basically, recipes are a way to automate these site building tasks and put them in a YAML file. They can also depend on each other. So you can have a recipe that applies other recipes and does all of these um, config actions as well to change the config that it applies. It comes, could come with its own config. It does not come with its own code. So recipes is a solution to automate site building stuff. Who of you? think that you will use Project Browser in your work? OK. Who of you think that Project Browser benefits your work? It's about the same people. OK. Same question about automatic updates. Who of you think that automatic updates benefits you in your work? There's a bit more. OK. Who of you think recipes benefits you in your work? OK. That's what I expected. So it's almost all of you, well, 2 thirds of you said recipe is good. And almost nobody said automatic updates or project browser is good. So this slide is for you. So 
my spiel for developers on a project browser this project browser adds quality metrics to expose the projects that are higher quality. So if you looked at the video, they expose projects that have security coverage. They expose projects that have uh, all kinds of other metrics that are uh, still being defined. So they could raise projects that have better update, update coverage. They could raise projects that have better security response. They could raise projects in the listing based on all kinds of different criteria that are used in more dependencies. I don't know, depending on what we want to expose. So basically, Project Browser can put stuff pe into people's faces that we think is higher qual quality. So it should concentrate efforts in the Contrib ecosystem on certain best practices. So you, as a developer, will have better modules because of Project Browser, because it concentrates the users on the modules that are good instead of them randomly finding a random voting module somewhere because they had the wrong keywords, they will find the right module with Project Browser. And the quality metrics that we're introducing in Project Browser will also encourage project maintainers to be better, uh, to uh, get, get better exposure. Automatic updates is the same thing. Basically, by automating the updates, we are exposing the pain of broken updates much sooner. So we are automating the pain. This is my spiel for automatic updates. So you get all the pain automatically much sooner. So my, my hope is that through this, uh, automatic updates will help increase the quality of updates because we are automating getting to the pain sooner. So if, you are, if your update is expected to run automatically, then it's expected to be able to function and be successful automatically, so it must be higher quality. So well, all, for all of the developers running Composer updates and Drush DB, you'll have a better update because of automatic updates, because it makes all of these updates better. That's my spiel for developers. And recipes, you all want recipes, so it's fine. But it will also help, what I think is it will also help concentrate the ecosystem uh, and proper innovation. So one thing is, for example, Jin will not need to add the Jin into core for Jin to be used by almost all Drupal sites if Jin is in most of the recipes and if Project Browser exposes those recipes, then people will just install something that has Jin. They don't care if it came with core. It didn't came with core. Who cares? You install 100 modules in your Drupal site anyway. So if it came with Jin as a country project or if it came with core, it doesn't matter. We can iterate much faster on what's part of the product if we have these recipes. Um, so ideally, it will not matter as much whether something is in core or not, because you get it from the recipe, maybe through Project Browser or through Composer. Will, you will get it from there, and we can iterate much faster on the recipes than we could iterate on core. And so Dries has this marketing term for this composable core. So this is the marketing term. But I would say, uh, ref referring back to the first day keynote where uh, we were su suggested that we should look at Drupal for SAS. I think this is a combination for Drupal for whatever, uh, because we could have the recipes that are a great recipe for an e-commerce site, a great recipe for a blog, et cetera. They could use uh, best practices, and we could see uh, which one works out. Uh, but we still have a problem with initiatives, that we have all of these solutions to get stuff into core, now we are also figuring out how we will not need to put stuff into core because we'll have recipes and project browser and automatic updates and they will concentrate efforts and raise quality and expose a bunch of things. Uh, but we are still have this problem with initiatives that are running for three years, four years, five years. They don't have a clear exit criteria and they are too much. So if you looked at the 2018 Dries note that we had 12 initiatives running across everywhere. And so a bit later, Dries decided to, instead of talking about initiatives, talk primarily about these tracks. And the tracks are more about what value we are providing in Drupal through these initiatives. So like make Drupal easy to evaluate and adapt or make Drupal easy for content creators and site builders is actually a value that we are providing. And I think tracks are actually a lot more important than initiatives because the initiatives are the fe are, tend to be the features that we are building and we can get stuck in thinking about the feature that we are building instead of looking at whether we are actually delivering the value and maybe we can deliver the value much faster um, with just part of the initiative or a different view on the 
initiative that we are working on. So he launched these tracks for Drupal 9, reduce cost and effort, drive the open web, prioritize the beginner experience, and be the best structured data engine. Um, and some of that was successful. But because we were more focused on these initiative deliverables instead of what value we are providing, uh, we haven't really moved much in the best structured data engine front, for example, even though there was a track with initiatives. Uh, so just yesterday or two days ago, actually, Larry posted a blog post on about slash core uh, about the tracks for Drupal 10.2. These are the tracks that we are looking to deliver value on. So reducing the time it takes for site builders to become proficient with Drupal, empowering site builders to deliver engaging editorial experiences, so that's more about the actual experience of the site, and reducing the cost of keeping Drupal applications secure. And how we are doing across these, Larry will have more of a session about that, but here are some examples of things that we, uh, we achieved outside of all the initiatives and these tracks. So for example, single directory components was not an initiative, but it certainly helps. It's certainly the biggest core uh, front-end improvement since Twig. Field UI improvements was not an initiative, was not part of an initiative, uh, but it helps with the structured data creation that Dries outlined for Drupal 9. Uh, we have a bunch of performance improvements where random contributions from different companies, including Google-funded projects, um, help us move forward in performance. And we have automated formatting and CK editor that makes the content editor experience much better. So we have a lot of these smaller things that are not three-year long initiatives that all together make Drupal 10.1 very exciting. And if we continue on this path, we'll make 10.2 even more exciting. So more about this later today in Larry's talk. I'm not going to delve into these anymore. So in conclusion, I think the future of initiatives, I was a bit reluctant to call them post-initiatives, so let's call them the new age of initiatives, is that with Project Browser and Automatic Updates, we will be able to increase the quality and collaboration within the contrib space so that it matters less if something is in core or not because things will be easy to find and things will be suggested. With recipes, we'll be able to deliver more Drupal-based products that are based on Drupal, easy to discover with Project Browser, and they are allow for a faster innovation because we can swap out components in recipes much faster than we can swap them out in core, so Contrib can go faster. With zooming in on things in core, looking more at delivering value instead of delivering a feature that we've been working on and really want to get in. Finally, we are able to deliver things that are make releases exciting and very useful for users. So smaller pieces of improvements will be useful. And that all should result in a more stable core because we'll be less need to tinker with core because a lot of things will be in recipes and contrib and, um, and will not make those big bang things that often anymore. So that should result in a more stable core and less changes and less disruption. So that's my spiel for where the initiatives are heading. Uh, let's meet after this in the Project Browser Buff. Let's go later to Larry's session. Let's work on Box Mesh and UX um, and see you around. Thank you. I think I may have used up all my time now. Did I? Any questions, questions or concerns? Just, um, it works. Just one concern about Project Browser. Mm -hmm. um, it's not going to happen often, but sometimes there are modules that have quality over quantity. And if you have an existing module with a high amount of installations that mm -hmm. is no longer moving forward, that is no longer getting regular updates, and there is this newer module that basically, you know, doesn't have a large user base yet, but has a really good quality regular updates, then that is going to be shown way further down the list in Project Browser. Yes. So what's going to happen is you're basically going to, or perhaps encourage people to install the older software with the more users, but as opposed to the newer software that you perhaps should be using. 
Yeah, so the concern was that there's a highly used module would show up even if it's not well maintained anymore and there's a better solution. I think recipes would be good for that. So what I would look for with the current best practices would be recipes because recipes are designed to be these automated site builder instructions. So they are much like you would do this manually and uh, apply it and then use it. Um, so recipes could adopt these new best practice solutions immediately because they don't need to support an upgrade path or do whatever. It's not as heavyweight as distributions. So they could adopt these new best practices much faster. And that we could put in scoring into Project Browser based on which how many recipes are using the new system or new solutions or something like that. But I would look more into recipes for the new, new best practices than for, for a Project Browser. If you already have a site with a, you're committed to using a certain ecosystem of modules, you probably don't want to invest in for the sake of having the best, newest solution on that same site. But in a new site, you would use a recipe to install the new site. You would get the new best practice, and you would be able to use the new best practice on the new site. That's the idea. Yes, yes. Thank you for the presentation. So can a recipe, for example, add a filter in the project browser uh, to say, this is my recommendations? The project browser is pluggable in terms of the sources of projects, yes. I don't know if it's currently pluggable in terms of filtering the list, but it has like multiple sources that it can take projects from. So you can have like a, my company suggests these modules for my clients kind of source, or your clients can pick out from those modules. Um, I don't know if currently there's a filtering plugin solution or a way to, to, uh, to go into project browser and filter, but there might be. So, it's a, so recipes can depend on modules to provide whatever functionality they need, so that's a possibility. There's one down here. Is there um, potential to combine, combine the project browser with recipes so that you could build um, not just UIs for enabling individual projects on your site, but also actual feature sets that yeah. clients could turn on and off? Yeah, the ultimate goal for, for Project Browser is to even be on the installer screen. So you, in the installer screen, you would get Project Browser, and you would pick out the site-level recipes that, that were one of the categories possible. And then later on, Project Browser inside Drupal, once you installed it, would also expose recipes. Then not, not all of the recipes will be site level. Some of them will be, here's a blog content type with a listing. Here's a voting widget thingy. And uh, you would be able to install from there, yes. Laurie, you wanted to? No? No. had one remark about the recipes thing you just said, yeah. um, where you could turn on or off a recipe. A recipe is a one-way thing right now, so you can only turn on a recipe. You can never turn it off again because the recipe doesn't exist once it's applied. So that's a good thing to keep in mind. Yeah, I didn't pick up on that. Yeah, so it's an it's a automation of what a site builder would do. So it automates what the site builder would do, and it's there. I have one question regarding the recipes. Is this on the long term something that will replace installation profile? Is this something that will work in a similar fashion? Yes, that uh, possibility, yes. We are still looking at like wh whether or how to convert core install profiles into recipes as well. We, recipes are not a thing that has been committed in core yet. So it's in development. It's not a thing that's uh, available in core. Uh, but that's one of the goals, is to convert the core install profiles into recipes, yes. And then be able to uh, convert any install profile into recipe. Me? Yes. This is on uh, the admin UI and JavaScript uh, modernization. It looks the priorities were, okay, it looks the administrative UI has been accomplished with the Claro. Uh, in the, the single React application is stroke through. And there is still open the modernized uh, underlying JavaScript code, but it looks that it's pointing to a closed uh, task uh, issue. So is still this going on? Or 
that is no the ad, no the admin UI and JavaScript modernization initiative itself as an initiative is not happening anymore. There is a lot of efforts currently on the admin UI that are not part of the, that initiative is over. And we have a lot of efforts in core uh, to improve the admin UI. There's a session tomorrow from Christina that you should go to uh, that you're going to get a lot of insights. It's a very exciting effort, I think, and follows a lot of these principles where we are trying to, instead of having these like multi-layer rewrite everything in something approach, we are looking at more on like these are the problems that we want to solve and how we solve some of these problems incrementally instead of rewriting everything. Cool. Thanks. Thanks for that. Last question, please. How to propose new initiatives? <laughs> How to propose new initiatives. So uh, there's a um, page on Drupal.org. So if you go to Drupal.org slash about slash core, there's the section on, I think, the community initiatives page explains how to propose new initiatives. Normally for core initiatives, it would be an ideas project. So Drupal.org slash project slash ideas. And it would explain your idea there. And magic fairies like Larry and myself would come in and review the idea and see if it made sense. Uh, we started a discussion about your uh, initiative proposal. Um, for community initiatives, they are more, they're basically self organized. There's no gates to, co to community initiative. Nobody's going to tell you not to do something. So you can do whatever initiative you want. I would suggest to sign up for doing that if you have some, if you have, think you have enough spare capacity to and have some of the traits outlined in the Dree slide uh, of, an, of an initiative lead so you can organize a team and, and communicate about your things. That helps a lot in getting more people involved and being successful. I think I missed some part of, your, uh, of the last point. To, to so if you have some of the traits of some of these traits that Dries outlined uh, for initiative leads, uh -huh. uh, way back from where should I go? Here. Uh, where where is it? No, I'm not gonna find. Oh, it's it. okay. I remember. Yeah. So if you have some of these traits, then that helps a lot. So it's similar to submitting a bug in the issue queue. You may or may not have people find out about it. So if you have if you have some uh, communication skills and organize a team, that helps a lot in driving people into your initiative and make it happen. Okay, Let's talk after the session is best. All right. Thank you.